And good morning, Third Church family. Welcome back. We come into our last sermon in 2 Kings, the 25th chapter, starting at verse 1. Let's go there right now. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the 10th day of the 10th month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He encamped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city had become so severe that there was no food for the people to eat. Verse 4 says, Then the city wall was broken through, and the whole army fled the night through the gate between the two walls near the king's garden, though the Babylonians were surrounding the city. They fled towards Araba, but the Babylonian army pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his soldiers were separated from him and scattered. He was captured. He was taken to the king of Babylon at Riblah, where the sentence was pronounced on him. They killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. They put out his eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. On the seventh day of the fifth month, in the 19th year, of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard and official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all of the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army under the commander of the imperial guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard carried into exile the people who remained in the city along with the rest of the populace and those who had gone over to the king of Babylon. But the commander left behind some of the poorest people in the land to work the vineyards and the fields. May God add a blessing to the hearer, reader, and doer of his holy word. Guess what, church? Raising kids can be very rewarding at times, as equally frustrating. Verbal instructions include, look, when you go into this place, you better act like you have some home training. And that's not only a word of warning to the child, but it's also a word of protection because the parent is trying to underscore that if you follow my instructions, it will be well with you, child, and you will be safe. But too often this verbal warning goes unheeded, and the children do what they want to do, and the parents have to get more forceful with their instructions, and even may have to escalate the situation to a time of show and tell. I told you what would happen if you don't listen. Now I have to show you, and that show can be very physical in nature. However, the desired result of focused attention is achieved like never before. But it's all done out of love, protection, and wanting the child to be a good representative of the family name and be successful in life, avoiding pitfalls and snares. What we will see today, church, is how the Lord is similar in dealing with his children, and we will also see the endless grace of God that he shows until it's time for show and tell. And the show results in a forced attention like never before. And I use for a sermon title today, Can You Hear Me Now? Today, church, we end our study of the kings of Judah, and from the end of chapter 23 of 2 Kings to the end of chapter 25, we have the last four kings of Judah, and they were all characterized as done evil in the eyes of the Lord. What we have seen over the past months of studying the patterns of kings, some serve God, some fall from God. Kings that have led people into deep spiritual abyss of idolatry. We saw last week that until the king Josiah Passover was hundreds of years without being celebrated correctly, and the book of the law was 75 years without being read. 
Josiah's response was to lead the people back to God, back to reading the word of God and the right worship, eliminating idol worship from the temple. This was very short-lived, a very short-lived revival of the people. And as soon as King Josiah died, the next four kings sent the people back into a time of idol worship, not serving God, not hearing from God, not reading the word, and flat out ignoring God. During this time, the last four kings continues to speak to the kings of Judah prior to the fall of Jerusalem, leading to Babylonian captivity. God did not cease to speak to them, even though they were not willing to listen to God. I believe there are times we get the wrong impressions of God based on our relationship with our parents who have to be disciplinarians, and that's not always pleasant. But what we miss with just focusing on the pain is the patience, the love, and wanting the best for the child through obedience. This is the same for God and even more. And when I look at the patience that God shows us and that was displayed in dealing with Israel, it is an unbelievable, unwavering patience, much more patient than we're even capable of. Until that patience turns to more drastic actions to protect us, even though it may seem quite the opposite, the discipline adage that is used by a lot of parents towards corrective behavior in their children is, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I personally never believe that in an earthly sense, but I absolutely believe that when it comes to God invoking discipline for corrective behavior in his children. Due to the stiff-necked, disobedient idol worship of Israel for hundreds of years led God to allowing the Babylonian captivity. And the Babylonian captivity was not pretty. It was brutal. Jerusalem was completely destroyed and many lost their lives. But have you ever looked at this act of captivity was a display of God's mercy, not merely punishment? God had to position his children to be able to hear him, to reconnect with him. Is that not the story of the cross? The crucifixion of Jesus was not pretty. It was brutal. And Jesus gave his life on that cross, but it was an act of love and grace. It was God positioning us to connect with him, to hear him, to be reconciled to him. So the outcome of Israel being exiled in Babylon wasn't the arbitrary decision of an uncaring God, but the consequences of Judah's persistent rebellion against God and God's intervention to save his children from themselves. The last four kings of Judah were characterized by a theme that we've heard consistently. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his forefathers had done. The sin of Judah led God's actions God didn't give up on them in spite of their rebellion. God will surely judge the action, but the judgment is not God's goal. Redemption is. Did you hear that? Punishment is not the goal. Redemption is. The Babylonian captivity of Judah was not God's end for them. It was a means to an end. The end is to bring them to understand the error of their ways, to humble themselves and return to God and be the people of God as an example to the world. Repentance is what God is seeking. And even in captivity, this patient God still urging the people to turn around. Let's look at this. Even in the midst of constant disobedience, we have such a patient God who continues to pursue us. The prophet Jeremiah was present and the Lord was speaking through him at this time. Let's look at some of the words of God through Jeremiah and the reactions of the people. In Jeremiah 22, this is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. But if you do not obey these commands, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this palace will become a ruin. They didn't listen. Next king, Jeremiah 26. 
Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they had done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, if you do not listen to the words of my servant, the prophets who I sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city a curse among all the nations on the earth. They didn't listen again. God is being extremely patient with Israel, but the tail is not working. Therefore, the show is coming. So they have not heard the word. So God says to Jeremiah, write it down on a scroll. So in Jeremiah 36, it says, take a scroll and write on it all of the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all other nations from the time I began speaking to you, the reign of Josiah to now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, each of them will turn from his wicked way. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. There is a saying when a rebellious child is acting disrespectful and not listening to the direction or correction of the parent, we say the child must be smelling themselves. And in Jeremiah 36, we see not only did the king not listen, we see that the king cut up the scroll God instructed Jeremiah to scribe and he threw it in the fire. So you're trying to tell me not only did you not do the chores that I wrote down, put on the refrigerator for you to follow them, you tore the paper up and you went outside to play. And we see the patience of God yet again. God says, well, take them another scroll. And guess what? They did the same thing and burned that one too. You know, church, there are not many sermons preached about this account. And the ones that are preached are about doom and gloom because of disobedience. But I see this account as an example of the grace and mercy of God and God not giving up on his children and using whatever means necessary that they may repent from their evil to accomplish his purpose. So what is God's purpose in all of this? So that his people will turn from their wicked ways and hear God, be connected to God again in your life. The greater that is coming can only be recognized and received with a deeper connection to God and increase in your faith and spiritual walk with God. Whatever has been going on in our present place of existence has caused our ears to dull caused our connection to God to be sketchy. Our prayers are pitiful. Our reading of the Bible is non-existence. What happens in a situation of too much comfort is we begin to rely on the resources and worship the blessings, ignoring the blessor. God sees what's coming and the fact that we need him in a greater capacity in order to survive and thrive and be that shining light for others. In our lives, it may be time for show because tail didn't work. So it's time for a deportation of sorts. It's time for a captivity of such. It's time to remove us from a place that has become so comfortable that we are asleep to God, as they say. We are a little too familiar. We are totally out of pocket. God is an afterthought. God is cool where he fits into my life, but my life is more than just God. Other things have my attention, my ear, my mind, my actions are anything but godly. So God has to allow a captivity of sorts to get our attention. And I don't know what that is in your life, but it's God saying, can you hear me now? Babylon is painful. 
It's oppressive. It's a struggle. I have had several Babylonian captivities myself. One in particular is when I had to transfer to a boss that was rumored to be absolutely crazy and my existence was just what was advertised, pure hell. I would be having a great morning on my way to work and as soon as I put on a lot, something would come over me and I would just get angry. But this time of Babylon, this time of separation from what my normal was, guess what happened? This pressure of exile caused my prayer life to increase, my study life to increase, my faith walk was stronger because those things in my present situation were blocking my connection with God and needed to be removed so that my focused attention was again on God. God needed me and I needed to grow in him. And that growth was not coming in my comfort zone. What I have been experiencing is what I call routine religion, routine religion, where I am just functioning and going through the motions of ministry, dotting I's, crossing T's, but not growing. Faith grows in the soil of adversity because we pursue God like oxygen when we're in Babylon. And here is a preview of next week in Babylon. Now what? You see, we have to be careful because the enemy wants us to focus on the pain of Babylon, the seemingly lack of resources in Babylon, the perceived loneliness in Babylon. And when we focus on those things, our stay will be extended because we're still not hearing God. So we don't focus on the pain. We focus on the deliverer. So Babylon for Israel and us was not due to a lack of revelations of God's word and God's will. It is with man's unwillingness to heed the word of God. Church, God loves us so much that he will get our attention. When we become children of God, we will not cease to be children of God. And now it's God who continues to raise us to be his children just like he is doing with Israel. And there will be times where we don't listen. We don't hear God. And God will send us a preacher and we say, well, that word was for someone else, not me. God will send us a teacher. And we'll say, well, you know, that was a good lesson. But guess what? It doesn't apply to me. We will tear up the Bible study lesson, even throw it away. Then all of a sudden, Tale is over and showtime begins. Then there's a situation of captivity, of Babylon. And we're saying to ourselves, I never thought I would be here. I never thought this was what happened to me. This is just not fair. What have I done to deserve this? And wondering, how did this happen? And we want to get mad at God and we want to say, God, what are you doing? But we don't realize that we have not cared about the warnings. And this present exile, albeit painful, was to save our life so that we could finally hear God and return to God. We don't realize that we have been in routine religion mode and not growing in God and just relying on the past for the future instead of increasing in God for the present. Babylon comes to draw us closer to God and increase our faith for the future God has planned and ordained for us. So don't think of your situation of unemployment is just by chance. Something has dulled our ears. Don't think that this transfer is by chance. We're too comfortable and not growing. Don't be shocked by relocation. Don't think that stay in the hospital, that injury that kept you out of the big game, that relationship that had just ended, things were not out of the blue. But was God's intervention because that person or that thing had become our God and was preventing our growth and hearing God. This is God saying to his children, can you hear me now? Because after almost a month with no money, prayer life was on something different now. 
God is moved from the back burner to the front eye on the stove of my life. God is saying, recognize me as your God and this Babylon can now end. At times we're too comfortable and our hearts get a little hard towards God. They, they do. We know from the parable of the sower that the problem is not with the seed representing the word of God because the seed can bring life, but the hardened ground that refuses to take in the seed. And Babylon is for us to have an opportunity to get that hard ground called our heart tilled up and ready to receive that seed. For Judah, the word of God couldn't take root in their heart and they rejected it. But God did not give up on his people. They gave up on God. God speaks to them. God continues to speak even though they're not willing to listen. God did not stop then and God will not stop today. He continues to speak to us through his written word. Listen and listen well. Obey God and be blessed. The scroll can be burned, but God's word will never be destroyed. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Captivity is not an end itself. It is just a means to an end. The end, as I've said before, is repentance and restoration. God wants them to understand the error of their ways, to humble themselves and return to him. The exile is just the means to that end. God's goal is to redeem, not to condemn, to restore, not to destroy. We will either listen to God now or we will hear him in exile. God is speaking. Can you hear him now? A few things we need to understand about God's discipline and hardship. In Hebrews 12, starting at verse 5, hear these words. And have you forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirit and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but later painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. God treats us as beloved children. God's motivation is love. He disciplines because he loves. God's goal is for our good. We share in his holiness and produce a harvest of righteousness and experience peace. The exile is not the destination, but it's a necessary stop on the journey because of what has transpired. It will be needed for what's in the future. So church exile is not meant to wonder why you got there because it's various reasons. But what will you do now that you're there? Will you cling to God? Will you grow in God? Will you listen to God, serve God in a greater capacity? What is coming? All of that is needed to be received. So our exile, yes, it's painful, stressful, not pleasant. But our Babylonian stay has a checkout time. Now, that was an amen moment right there. This job situation that you're going through, checkout is coming. This sickness that has invaded your body, checkout is coming. Listen, your present situation of captivity is God staging an intervention to disrupt what you have come to know as normative to get you to a place to totally rely on him, to find strength in him, to reconnect with him and to hear him. Can you hear me? Now, once the purpose of Babylon is achieved, God will end it. But in our time of captivity, remember, God is still in control. 
God always has the final word. Babylon was not in control of Judah's future. It was God. God was using Babylon for his end. Even though Babylon meant evil for the Israelites, they were still being protected by God. and Babylon was under God's control. God did not speak to terrify, but to save. Warnings are meant to save us, not to harm us. God's goal, even in captivity, is still the same. Repent, be forgiven, and come back to God. I want to thank you for tuning in today. Next week, we're going to explore the one piece of scripture that was written during the time of captivity, Psalm 137, in a sermon titled, Responding in Our Babylons. I pray that you join us as we continue to grow spiritually with the study of the word of God. Until then, remember, be patient, be kind, be compassionate with everyone you come in contact with. Remember, Learn the intended lessons in Babylon because it's only temporary. God bless you. God keep you. And we're going to see you next week.